Last week, the big story was who would capture the pole position for this year's 89th running of the Indianapolis 500. And Dreddy Green racing driver Tony Kanaan held off a furious challenge by Roger Penske's team. And we'll start next Sunday's race from the top spot. But what about the rest of the field? Today, we'll see who will make up the remainder of the 33 starting spots. And we'll also bring you the story of the courageous return of Kenny Breck, the 1999 500 winner who nearly lost his life in a crash a year and a half ago. Day three of qualifying at Indianapolis is next. to the world's greatest race course, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, where day three of Indy time trials continue. When this day began, we had 11 positions yet to be filled for the field of 33. Thus far, eight drivers have completed qualifying runs, which now puts the field at 30, and three spots, only three remain. Big story today, not only the return of the 1999 Indy 500 winner, Kenny Breck, but the fact that he posted the fastest four-lap average of the month. No, not the day, but the month. Breck, 227.598 miles per hour, makes him the fastest car in the field. And despite being the fastest in the field, though, he will start 23rd because the rules here at Indy dictate the top 22 were slotted in position last Sunday on pole day. Today, the 11 they take, that spots 23 through 33, so he will start 23rd. Slowest car will be bumped after the 33 are filled either later today or on tomorrow. So to summarize qualifying, Tony Kanon is our pole setter from last Sunday at 227.566. The quickest qualifying, best qualifying spot ever for a female driver, Danica Patrick, she starts fourth. 30 cars are in the field, but the fastest guy out there, Kenny Breck, the 1999 winner at 227.598 miles per hour. Now, Kenny becomes the 15th different driver in Indy history to post the fastest time in the field, yet not start on the pole. And our Vince Welch caught up with him. Kenny Breck signing some autographs for the fans here. Certainly a very popular driver back in Indianapolis. Uh, uh, after a 1999 victory here and then everything you went through with the accident in 2003, how gratifying is it to be back in the field here at Indianapolis? It's a great feeling. You know, we're in the field now and uh, we're going to have to continue working on race setup to get good for the race. But I want to thank obviously all the fans and God for letting me be back here and Team Ray Letterman for giving me the opportunity. So uh, it's, it's a great feeling, Honda and everybody. Not just back in the field, but the fastest car in the field, 227.598. I believe it's the first time since Ari Leyendijk in 96 that the fastest qualifier hasn't been the pole setter. So a little, little extra history for Kenny Breck. Well, that's uh, the new qualifier rules, you see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the game plan now, Kenny, now that you're in the field? Obviously, you don't have a lot of laps or a lot of miles uh, in, this, in this race car. So what's the game plan now the rest of the day and tomorrow? Well, we need to run more in race trim, and uh, Vitor is going to be out there with me, uh, Vitor Mira, in the other rail Letterman car, and uh, Danik, I think she's done running. She's run a lot of miles here already, but we need to just uh, fine-tune the race setup and hopefully to get uh, a steady race car underneath us so we can do some good on race day as well. Finally, did you ever think this day would come again through all the months of rehabilitation? Did you ever feel truly in your heart that you were going to get another chance? Well, you can never predict the future. I, I, I think I learned that from all this, but uh, I never gave up hope. I kept faith and hope that uh, something might and can happen, and that's why I was ready to take this challenge when it came. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been here. Uh, so uh, it's good to be able to write uh, my own chapter in my own book. We're very happy for you. Thank you. Kenny Breck. Kenny Breck never gave up hope and kept the faith. That's why he made it back here today. Glad to have you with us, along with 19 or 2,000 pole sitter and four-time front row starter, Greg Ray. I'm Jerry Punch. Here is the uh, minutes click away here on day three of Indy Time Trials. And, Greg, a phenomenal effort by, by Kenny Breck to put that car in the field. But now there are just three spots remaining. And the guys that are out there practicing are Jimmy Kite, who's, in, who's qualified four times, Anthony Ford, who's qualified twice, and a rookie, a raw rookie, Ari Leindyke Jr., who just got on the track uh, actually less than 24 hours ago for the first time. 
Yeah, I tell you what, I don't, I don't really have uh, any issues. I think A.J. Foyt, uh, the fourth, is going to do just fine. Uh, Jimmy Kite's a veteran. He hasn't been in a car a lot uh, in the last couple years, but he knows his way around this track. But I'll tell you, if I'm Ari Leindyke Jr., I, I'm, I'm not sure what he's thinking. You know, he's in the very, very deep end of the pond. Uh, he's got a lot of racing experience, but he's never had an IndyCar race. This is a very, very competitive field. And, uh, it, you know, he, he hasn't had a chance to really get acclimatized to the cars, to the tracks, to the other drivers. And, um, I mean, it's, it's a, that's a steep learning curve. Well, Ari Leindyke Sr. won this race twice in 90 and 97, turned the fastest laps ever in qualifying here. Ari Jr., on the other hand, has never even made a qualifying attempt. They're both standing by with our Jamie Little. Well, Dr. Punch, there's a lot of firsts going on here between the two Lion Dykes. Senior here watching his son make a run for it today, perhaps, and for the very first 500 for you. Ari, what a couple days it's been for you. I think every emotion. What are your thoughts right now after passing this rookie orientation? Well, we're going to try to just get a little bit more speed out of the car. We're going to go out there in the Curb Record sponsored car and, you know, see what we can uh, do for today. We're going to try to put it in line today to qualify because of the weather uh, forecast for tomorrow. So we'll see what we can do. You know, I don't want to be on the last row, so we're going to try our hardest to get some speed out of it now. Now, you went out there and ran some laps today with a lot of veteran drivers. Meanwhile, you're sitting here trying to complete your rookie orientation. I haven't seen any drivers push it to the limit like you did. Did that fall on the nerves a little bit? No, nah, today it was actually okay, but yesterday was a little bit nerve-wracking. Uh, I had to do my first phase of the rookie orientation, which is 195 to 200, while Kanan and Frank Heaty are blowing by me on the outside. So it was pretty nerve-wracking to do that yesterday. But, you know, after getting a night of sleep and thinking about what I need to do, to do today, it really helped a lot. And now uh, I'm more focused today, and hopefully we can put something together for qualifying. What kind of advice has your dad given you? Um, just be smooth. Really uh, work on the line and... Uh, I think I'm, I've accomplished that, and now we're just trying to just be more consistent and slowly work up to speed, and hopefully, uh, you know, everything goes right today, and, and we can pull in line in qualifying and, and then put in the show. So perhaps we will see you out there for your run, and we'll talk to Dad here, two-time Indy 500 champion, the king of smooth. What's it like having your son out there? Totally different scenario for you. Yeah, it is. It's, it's nerve-wracking for me because uh, I know the pressure he's under right now, not having really a lot of laps under his belt, and... You really do need laps around here and uh, obviously he's missed so much track time with the weather and the problems we had yesterday mechanically so we thought it, we'd get him three days of running in and right now we're at uh, just today basically so he might qualify later if he's not ready then we'll just do it tomorrow what is your game plan if you do make it out there to go for a qualifying run what is the time frame you're looking at well, we want to be at least ahead of uh, one or two or three guys because that gives us a cushion in case somebody else shows up tomorrow and decides to to put a, a car in the show that uh, they still have sitting in the garage right now. But I don't see that scenario really happening because uh, around Indy, it's uh, a little bit about a little bit like uh, uh, soap opera here. You pretty much know what everybody else is up to. All right. Well, if Ari Leindyke Jr. makes it in the field today or tomorrow, they will become the 24th father-son duo to ever qualify for the Indy 500. Dr. Punch. Very nice, Jamie. In fact, uh, Ari Jr., a two-time participant here in Menards Infinity Pro Series action, finished third in the Menards Infinity Pro race a year ago. Our comprehensive coverage of Indy 500 time trials will continue at 6 o'clock Eastern time back over on ESPN2, so we won't chronicle what happens as three spots are still up for grabs in qualifying. When we come back, we'll look at some of those that have already run this afternoon and where they are in the starting field. ESPN's presentation of Indy 500 time trials is being brought to you by Cialis. Cialis is here. Ask your doctor if a free sample of Cialis is right for you. And a brief lull here at the uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway for a track inspection as we continue with day three of Indy 500 time trials. Eight cars have qualified today which means we have 30 in the field. We'll bring you up to speed with some of the guys who have gone out while we were away here just moments ago. How about the 34-year-old Alta Loma, California driver, Jacques Lazier, former IRL IndyCar winner at Chicagoland Speedway. Whoa, Jacques has a wiggle on the first time out today. He went out in the Playa del Racing machine, but then he goes out for a second attempt, and, and the laps look very, very good, Greg. 
Yeah, I tell you, uh, Jacques Lazier is a uh, very steady driver. He hasn't had a lot of time in the car, and this is a new effort. Uh, they're running a Honda-powered uh, G-Force, and I think they have a lot of experienced crew members. One of the crew members there, Rush Glassholm, he was a uh, incredible asset to the team that I ran for the last two years, and uh, you know they have a lot of people there, and they're they're getting that uh, program up to speed very very quickly. Jacques Lazier driving. It's called Playa del Racing, and uh, that basically. Uh, translates to beach racing. Gary Salee and Susan Schaefer, who live in Playa del Rey, California, are the co-owners. As you see Jacques Lazier coming by, great laps for Lazier, very consistent, 221-615, 221-593, then 220.084 for a four-lap average for Jacques Lazier, making his 44th IRL IndyCar Series start. The four-lap average, 221.228. Yeah, I think the unique thing about uh, his run is uh, his, his warm-up lap uh, was faster than his third qualifying lap, so everybody had to go by the same rules that they did last weekend, third time by. He had four very solid laps, dropping the third. Action Gaming, uh, Sirius Radio, Batteries.com, the sponsors. He finished his run, and our Vince Wells caught up with him. Jock, congratulations back in the field for the Indy 500. Well done. Thank you. It's... Uh... Uh, what a run. I mean, the, the first time we went out, we, we went pretty good into turn one, and the thing stepped sideways on me. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to show the side of the, the car, show off some sponsorship and all that. But, you know, we came back here, we made an adjustment, and uh, actually on the third lap, I think we went a little too far because the car had a pretty big push going into turn one. But, you know, all things said and done, I'm extremely proud of Playa del Racing, everything they've done. I mean, we basically had a tub three weeks ago, and here we are in the Indianapolis 500. It's just an absolute thrill. What's the game plan now? Uh, do you try to get a better speed? Do you take the speed that you've got and just work on the race setup? No, I think we're, we're happy with that. I mean, there's, there's obviously no reason to. I think what we'll do from here is we'll just go in and put our race package on and, and uh, go out there and tow around a little bit and have some fun and see how we stand with our race, race car. Any better feeling than knowing that you've done it when you've taken that checkered flag and knowing that you've qualified for the Indianapolis 500? You know, taking a checkered flag and qualifying for any race, especially in this series, is absolutely huge. But, uh, you know, the, the, just to be here in the Indy 500, I mean, it, it's, it honestly is just a, a huge part of a, of a driver's life. And, and it's, it's such an honor to be here. I'm, and I, and almost out of, you know, with, with a loss for words, trying to, trying to say how I really feel about being in this race. It's absolutely spectacular. Congratulations. Thanks, Vince. Appreciate it. You know, I think Jacques said it right. They're just there. Uh, you know, his uh, qualifying attempt was spectacular. He he got everything that car had to offer. You know, warming up at a 221, ran two 221s two, following that, and then fell off just a little bit to 220 flat, and then uh, brought it back up again. He was absolutely getting everything out of that car, and uh, he, he did a great job. Those are the words of the 2000 pole sitter here and four-time front row starter. Greg Ray, who also won the uh, IRL IndyCar Series Championship back in 1999. And speaking of IndyCar champions over the years, uh, I guess Vince Welch, this guy has to be the all-time tops when it comes to wins in open wheel cars. Four-time Indy 500 winner, A.J. Foyt. He has one car in the field, Larry Foyt, your son, but you're trying to get your grandson, Anthony, in. Uh, what seems to be the problem, A.J.? We have no power. That's a big problem. No power at all. Then they got a used motor they got from Target that he practiced with all week. It ain't no power. That's all that's wrong. What's, uh, what options do you have at this point? Well, I don't have no options that park the damn car, and that's what I'm getting ready to do. A.J. Foyt very frustrated, and uh, Anthony Foyt in the car, knowing that he wants to get a little more out of it for uh, Grandpa Foyt, but just not having much luck so far today. Well, if you want to make A.J. angry, just tell him he's slow on the racetrack or he doesn't have the horsepower because that'll fire him up in a hurry, and obviously he's fired up. You were listening while we were away on the radios to some of the conversations, Greg Ray. What was the discussion like? Well, you know, I think uh, Anthony's uh, very pleased with the car, but, uh, you know, he said uh, the best motor that he felt uh, was the one that ended up uh, creating a lot of smoke there in his other qualifying attempt. And, you know, I think the thing that people don't realize... Um, uh, about A.J. Foyt is away from the racetrack, uh, a lot like maybe uh, Dale Earnhardt Sr. He's the sweetest, most giving, kind man. But I tell you what, you get him angry, don't stand near him because the uh, elbow is probably going to fly. You don't know what you're going to expect from him, but he's very, very smart. 
and you can tell he's very frustrated and very angry that uh, his cars aren't going faster. Yeah, he's 70 years old, but he can still move. If you make him mad, you better hustle out of the way. The legendary Super Tech trying to get his grandson up to speed. We'll chronicle that story when we come back in just a moment. The faces of Indianapolis, they have certainly seen it all. Dreams realized. And for some, hopes dashed. There is no better feeling than when you complete those four consecutive laps and you can smile and give that thumbs up and know you're in the field. The frustrations were there, but you did it. You got in the Indy 500 finally. It was a long wait. The celebration continues, particularly when you know you're the fastest guy here on pole day and you will lead him down. As we look live at our practice continuing here on day three of Indy time trials. Trying to get up to speed some of the cars that have already qualified. If you just joined our coverage, we'll remind you once again, we have 30 cars in the field and only three spots remaining. Among those drivers that are searching for speed, Jimmy Kite, who's subbing for the injured rookie, Paul Dana. AJ Ford to fourth, Anthony Ford, who blew an engine in qualifying earlier and the raw rookie, Ari Leyendock Jr. Now on the track right now, one of our front row qualifiers and former pole sitter here, the 1996 series co-champion, Scott Sharp. Yeah, I tell you what, Scott Sharp's been very, very impressive this month up until qualifying pole day. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people weren't uh, expecting him to perform the way he did. He was the first car out, you know, one of the first cars out, and uh, that time held the whole day to keep him on the front row. He's one of uh, three champions. All the, the drivers on the front row are past Indy Racing League champions. And I'll tell you, today I've been watching him in traffic. He's running with full fuel and uh, running in lots of traffic. He's been very, very aggressive. And uh, I tell you what, Scott's looking very, very good on the racetrack. I, I know he's excited for, uh, for race day. You know what I like best about when you visit with Scott Sharp this year, the spring in his step is back. Scott Sharp suffered through an abysmal year last year trying to qualify. They were down on horsepower. They had struggles. And now he comes back this year with the Delphi Fernandez racing team. Engineer John Moore, Mike Sales, Tony Leith, all the guys there, Adrian Fernandez. I mean, what, what a difference a year makes. He comes off with that great second place finish uh, at Motegi, and he comes to Indy knowing and believing he can win this race. You know, he's had a, a long relationship with Delphi, the sponsor that's uh, his primary sponsor there with Fernandez Racing. And I think he has uh, not achieved some of his uh, on-track racing goals the last couple of years. And I know he definitely had a spring in his step uh, coming to uh, Fernandez Racing, having G-Force chassis and uh, having Honda Power. I think Scott views this as a, uh, the best season or the best chance he's ever had at uh, winning the Indianapolis 500. And I think it shows from his commitment over the winter months. He went on a really, really tough training regime. He lost a lot of weight and he's really focusing on the little details. And I tell you what, he'll, he'll be tough on race day. We mentioned he starts on the outside of row one. Indy's all about history and heritage. And this year's front row, all IndyCar Series champions, reigning series champion Tony Kanaan on the pole, two-time champion Hornish in the middle, and the 1996 co-champion of the IRL on the outside. All three former IRL IndyCar champions, first time since way back in 1991, when it was the likes of Mears, Foyt, and Mario Andretti. So history repeating itself some 14 years later. Now we have an all-championship row one. Yep, uh, this is uh, one of the cheaper cars. You know, they've uh, they've really struggled for speed. They've uh, they weren't uh, they really weren't haven't been one of the leading cars uh, all month long, and they they've really really struggled. And so, you know, Patrick Carpentier and uh, Alex Barron, they're very very good race car drivers. And uh, I tell you what, if they can just try to get uh, their race speed, the race trim speed up, uh, they have great pit stops, uh, great strategy, and uh, they'll be tough on race day as well. I don't know what they've done since what happened on Sunday, but they must have poured a little Red Bull in those machines because they are certainly found some horsepower. Here's what happened this morning with the uh, likable French-Canadian Patrick Carpentier. He was getting every ounce out of it, maybe, maybe an ounce and a half too much because he pancakes the right side. Now, second time he goes out, the car was solid and very quick. You know, Patrick, those, uh, those uh, qualifying laps were some of the fastest laps he ran all month long, and he ran... 223 right out of the box and then 222 222 222 and so 
Yeah, they really sucked it up uh, for this last uh, qualifying attempt. And that, that attempt before that, they just tried to take so much downforce out of the car. He just couldn't get the car to turn. And uh, looks like they've made lots of improvements. And uh, he's safely in the field, I think, on the ninth row. 33-year-old Patrick Carpentier. He won in the open wheel champ car competition over the years. But he's a rookie here in the IRL IndyCar Series and a rookie here at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. But gets that car solidly in the field. His four-lap average for uh, Carpentier, 222.803 miles per hour. And currently, he sits on the inside of row number nine. So uh, a great effort by the Red Bull Cheever team, Eddie Cheever, Max Jones, and all the engineers there pulling together to get Carpentier up to speed here in this second run. And I tell you what, uh, you know, even though you've won somewhere else, and when you come here as a raw rookie, there's a lot to learn. It is, you know, uh, Patrick Carpentier is a great driver. He's won at every championship uh, level he's ever been at. So he's not really a rookie uh, in, the, in the way the word uh, is phrased like uh, Sebastian Bourdais. Both those guys are uh, very, very fast guys. After he completed his run and comes down for the average of 222.8, our Vince Welch caught up with him. Vince? Patrick Carpentier in the field for the Indianapolis 500. Your first Indianapolis 500. Are you relieved? Yeah, very really, very happy. I mean, man, it seems like it would never end. You know, we tried to put it in, tried to put it in, always something, and uh, we got bumped out last week and hit the wall this morning a little bit, and so I'm very happy, very happy. We improved the car during the week, and we think we have a decent race car, so it's great to be in the show. After uh, the uh, events that you've been through, as you mentioned, you, you struggled last week, get bumped out, you brushed the wall today. Are you holding your breath for those four laps that you're out there trying to get it in? Yeah, because we just want, just want to make sure the car was not going to push, so we cranked going in and everything, and now it was loose. I was like, man, the car is too loose, and the team was not sure if they wanted to stop the run, but they just kept going, and it was really on the edge, but at least we had some speed, so it was good. I know you've been around racing for a long time. Obviously, you're not a rookie racer, but a rookie to Indianapolis. What does it mean to you to be in the field now for the 500? Uh, very happy. You know, it's a, a great feeling. Even though we're not up the front, it's fantastic feeling. I'm really happy. We think the car is better for the race. That's what we're going to look for. That's what we worked on last week. And if we can have a good race, that's all I want. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Great to be in. Yeah, Patrick Carpentier, and he indeed is a man of his word. How do we know that? Well, back in 2003, he said, if I win this race at Mid-Ohio, I will actually run down the front straightaway buck naked. Well, he wrapped up in the checkered flag, but he did indeed keep his word because he won the race that day. I don't know if I would ever have done that. The checkered flag and Patrick making a nice little streak down the front straight. He is solidly in the field. More qualifying from Indy in just a moment. Day three of Indy 500 time trials continues. We have 30 cars qualified. Three spots still remain as practice is ongoing right now. Cars trying to get up to speed to begin their qualifying runs here later today. We currently sit with a pole sitter of Tony Kanaan, 227.566. Fastest and best qualifying effort ever by a woman in Indianapolis. Danica Patrick becomes the fourth woman to qualify. She will start fourth. 30 cars in the field. And the big story today, Kenny Breck comes back from that incident 19 months ago and has the fastest four-lap average in the entire month of May. That's what's happening on the track. Let's head back to the garage area and Vince Well. Thank you, Dr. Poncho. Any second out on the racetrack, I mean, when you talk about the Indy Racing League and the IndyCar Series events, one second can make the difference between winning a race or finishing fifth or sixth or even further back. How do you gain a second on the track? Well, sometimes you gain those positions by having excellent pit stops. And we're taking a look here at the uh, Panther racing machine of Thomas Inga. To get better pit stops, the Panther racing team uses what's called a pit stop coach, a personal trainer, a physical trainer that actually works with the crew members. I'm speaking with Tim Drudge, who holds that capacity with Panther racing. Tim, what are some of the things you work on to try to get the crew to make quicker stops? Well, with the right rear guy, we're working on sprint, sprints and acceleration to the right rear because he has, obviously has to run to the right rear uh, tire. The other thing we, we tend to focus on is hand-eye coordination. I think that's something that people don't really think about when they're talking about pit crews, but the, to get on the hub as quickly as they can is really, really important, and it really slows the stop down if they have to, if they have to hit it twice. Uh, so that 
that really takes a lot of time off and, and really can make or break the stop. I understand you do a lot with videotape and video training and uh, breaking that tape down with the crew members just as a football coach may break down uh, game film with a, with a football player. Right. Yeah, that's, that's very important. In fact, a lot of guys have, have told us that that's just as valuable as the workouts that we do because they really get to self-analyze. We'll keep an eye on some of these pit stops as uh, Thomas Schechter and Thomas Engel work on their stops here uh, on this day of uh, time trials at Indianapolis. All right, thank you very much, Vince. You know, over the years, you know, we've heard a lot of ways that coaches have helped these crew guys across the wall. Some of them, Greg Ray, were talking about using aerobics instructors. Some of them were talking about having their guys do modern dance classes. Do you ever do that for your crew? Uh, no, I, I think I'd have a hard time talk, talking them into uh, modern dance uh, <laughs> classes. But, uh, you know, it is very uh, physically difficult. It's very mentally punishing. This is the Indy 500. This is the Super Bowl of all races. And it's not just the driver feeling the pressure. I mean, it's every single person that touches that car because they know they can all win or they can all lose. And any one mistake can cause the whole team to lose. So it's pressure for everybody. No doubt these guys are athletes. A lot of times former NFL players or Major League Baseball players come, come to racing and use their athletic skill to become a crew member because of their overall strength and hand-eye coordination. Well, we told you we'll take a look at some of the cars that ran while we were away. We'll take a look at Ed Carpenter, the 24-year-old Indianapolis native, who went on the racetrack to uh, attempt for, to make his 24th career start. And indeed, he did, driving for Vision Racing for his uh, stepfather, Tony, and his mom, Laura George. Larry Curry, the chief engineer there, and Carpenter getting up to speed. His first qualifying attempt of the day. You know, that's, uh, it, it goes to show you as well, he turned 250 laps of practice this week, and uh, his fastest speed all week long was 220.4, and he qualified very solidly, 222, 220, 220, 221. And so, again, fastest laps he turned all month long was in qualifying, so uh, those guys got it together at the right at the right time. Yeah, he brought the speed back up, actually, on lap three and lap four. This, uh, this run taking place about 1.30, local time this afternoon we had just signed off when he went out to qualify so he uh, turned a four lap average of 221.439 miles per hour and uh, Ed of course who won the very first Menards Infinity Pro Series uh, Futaba Freedom 100 here he led every lap but one in that event from the pole so uh, no stranger to success here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. When he won that race two years ago here, it was one week after he had graduated with a marketing degree from Butler University. So he graduates from college one week. The next week, he's a winner at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Pretty two, pretty good two weeks there for Ed Carpenter. Pretty amazing thing for him to uh, have on his resume to say that he won at Indianapolis and it wasn't a uh, Menards Infinity Pro Series car, but uh, to have that on your resume is a, uh, it's a pretty cool thing. Live practice here on the racetrack, and uh, one of the cars that everyone says may be the sleeper, if he is a sleeper, I, I gotta believe this guy's gonna be one of the favorites on race day, Adrian Fernandez in that, in that red and white numeral number five going by, driving for the fernandez Monon effort with Honda Power, and he has been quick in practice, but pretty much under the radar all month. Yeah, you know, there's there's so many uh, super teams and uh, high-profile drivers and uh, everybody posting fast times, and. You know, Adrian hasn't raced uh, earlier this year, and I, I think he's all but said that this is really his final race, and uh, he definitely wants to win at Indianapolis 500, and he's been fast all week long. He's been fast in traffic, and uh, he's been very racy out there today, and I don't know if that you could call him a sleeper. He won three times last year. Um, he's driving the same type of car, a Honda Power G-Force car that he did last year. Um, you know, and it's all about momentum, and I think he's been around a long time. He knows when to crescendo, and that is on race day. Oh, you mentioned his three wins. His three wins came in the last six races of the year, so, uh, and he had a phenomenal effort in 2005, or, you know, just or 2004, rather, I mean, with the, with the way he uh, finished up the season. But the word is that, uh, you know, he and Mo Nunn hooked up for this race and they've had such a good time. It's become a very, a very valuable asset to his other two cars he has with uh, Kosuke Matsura and Scott Sharp there. So Adrian Fernandez, his 13th year in uh, major open wheel competition. By the way, he has not driven this year in 2005 in an IRL IndyCar, but he did go on March 11th down to Columbia and get married. So he and Catalina are still basically honeymooners. 
spending somewhat of his honeymoon here qualifying for the Indy 500. I think if you look at the two cars out there running nose to tell, that's uh, Scott Sharp and Adrian Fernandez, and they are teammates, and so they're definitely working on trying to run in dirty air, uh, run different lines, and uh, push each other. Most of those guys have been very, very fast. Uh, today, Scott Sharp is the second quickest car at 223.8, and Fernandez is right there. Uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, 226.5 two, and Fernandez at 226.3. So both those guys, they're on the gas. Absolutely. Sunday qualifying for the 89th running of the Indianapolis 500 continues with bump day on ABC and ESPN. Indy 500 time trial Sunday, 1 o'clock Eastern time on ABC and ESPN 2's coverage starting at 5 Eastern time. The final dramatic hours of bump day on our Disney and live Network. Welcome you back to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. That is Ari Leyendijk Jr. out for practice, and he is one of the cars that's yet to qualify. We still have three openings in the field in the uh, Curb Acujanium uh, Greg Beck entry, car number 98. Leyendijk Jr., if you're just joining our coverage, did not get on the racetrack until the final minutes of practice on Friday afternoon. He has been out here less than 24 hours. In fact, he has turned 37 laps today, only nine laps yesterday, so 46 total laps in his Indy our IRL IndyCar Series career at this racetrack, and yet he is probably just moments away from making a qualifying run to get that car into the field. There's a lot of things we don't know about Indianapolis Motor Speedway. A lot of question marks uh, yet to be answered, questions yet to be ascertained here in the last two days of qualifying. But one thing we do know is that for the 56th time in Indy 500 history, the winner will ride home on Firestone tires. For more, here's Jamie Little. Well, Jerry, part of the strategy here at Indy is tire conservation. Every team gets 35 sets of tires. That has to last them through practice, through qualifying, and the race itself. Now, a way that Firestone keeps everybody honest, look at this. They started this this year. It's a barcode. Basically, when the tire is created in the factory, it gets a barcode, and it's followed all the way through its usage until it goes back to research and development. So everybody knows where this tire came from, that this came from the number three, Elio Castroneves, that Sam Hornish Jr.'s team can't just use this tire to throw on if they need it. Now, they also this year color-coded. Right rear is red, left rear is white. And they did that so you don't confuse the rear tires. And I'll tell you why you don't want to do that. The right rear is just a little bit taller in diameter. That's what we call stagger. It makes the car want to turn left. So you can imagine, you mess these two tires up, the car's not going to want to handle so well. So this year, Firestone came out with these new ideas to keep everybody on their toes. So conservation is key here. 35 sets, and that's it. Dr. Punch. Thank you very much, Jamie. Well done. I mean, they, they and the reason they barcode those tires because that's about as closely guarded a secret as how they're made as anything the, the defense department has. Well, you know, I think uh, that's exactly right. And uh, Jamie did a great job of explaining that. You know, you only have 35 sets for the entire month, and you really need eight or nine sets just for the race. So, you know, a lot of these teams and drivers these last couple of days that are qualified, they've been out there doing light scrubs, making sure that the, the tires are balanced. And they can also lean on them for one lap, not take too much rubber off the top. And the drivers can say, this set felt really good. This set turned better. This set had a little bit of push. And those drivers know what they want to feel from those tires, but they, they need eight or nine sets less. So tire conservation, that's definitely the mode. And if you have a teammate, by the way, you cannot share tires. You, you, what, those tires that are Elio Castro and Emerson, that's his 35 sets, and the 35 sets that Sam Hornish has, they are belong to each individual driver. You can't share. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, that's a great thing they've come up with, because in the past, you know, uh, some teams would decide they'd want to run a car on the second weekend of qualifying. They'd put an entry in, they'd try to get all the tires, and they'd end up taking those tires from that that second or third entry, and then letting some of their star performers or their, their primary efforts take those tires. So there is a big advantage there, and uh, they've done a very good job of trying to tighten the belt. And, you know, you don't want to think things like that, but I tell you what, everybody pushes as hard as they can. And if they can find an advantage somewhere and you're not looking, they're absolutely going to take it. Well, speaking of Sam Hornish a moment ago, his wife Crystal standing by with our Vince Welch. Thank you very much, Doc. We talk so much about the drivers and all of the uh, drama that they go through through the course of the month, but uh, we seldom get an opportunity to visit with the wives. And uh, Crystal, it, it's a, a dramatic month for the entire family when you're trying to get into the Indy 500. And I know, uh, especially with Sam, the, the hopes are, are very high. Do you find it to be a little different at Indy compared to the other tracks you go to? Most definitely. This is a tough race, tough track, and 
we're just really hoping for the best next Sunday and Sam's really looking forward to it and it's just really nerve-wracking and exciting all at the same time. Now Sam has said that he's a little moody at times. He has admitted that he's a little moody. Do you find him a little more on edge uh, this month? Oh, most definitely. <laughs> he's uh, he's a lot more um, anxious and nervous. All, there's just all these emotions that go through during the month of May and it's really hard to express everything and he handles himself really well. I don't think I could do it any better. So I'm really proud of him, how he handles everything. And I think he, he's looking forward to the race and I think he'll do really well this year. I know Sam is a big movie buff and you guys watch a lot of movies. Have you seen a uh, good movie lately? Uh, we haven't had time to really go to the theater lately. The last time we watched the new movies, we on our way to Japan and uh, we got to spend some alone time together on the flight there so that was en enjoyable but we really haven't had a whole lot of time to watch any movies but hopefully pretty soon we'll have some time to enjoy ourselves i know sam uh, you and sam went slot car racing racing the slot cars last week he's a big fan of that now is he as good at with the slot cars as he is with the real car yeah he's good at everything i tell you what he's just so competitive he can figure out how to do something just so quick and i take forever and I usually give the controls over to somebody else because I'm not near as competitive as him. It's really hard to play with them. She's a, enjoying a practice, a little bit of practice time here at the Speedway. Always out in the pit lane, keeping an eye on her husband, Sam Hornish Jr. No question, Vince. Great support by Crystal there. You know, Penske, one of the names synonymous with success here. And when we come back, we'll take a look back at Roger Penske's 13 Indy 500 victories here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, including three of the last four years. And welcome back to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway as we have day three of Indy Time Trials continuing. Here are the cars yet to qualify today. Jimmy Kite trying to qualify for his fifth Indy 500. Ari Line Dyke Jr., the rookie, uh, yet to make ever make a qualifying attempt in IndyCar Series competition. And A.J. Foyt, the fourth, trying to qualify for his third Indy 500. And earlier in the afternoon, we had a car go out to qualify, and that was the former Rookie of the Year here, Jeff Ward, the Newport Beach, California driver, originally hailing from Glasgow, Scotland, 43 years of age, and goes out to qualify in the Vision Racing Machine. Yeah, he's running a Delara Toyota, and uh, I tell you, Jeff's, uh, Jeff's won at everything he's ever done as well. Motocross, whether it's two wheels or IndyCar uh, on four wheels, uh, he's very, very solid. But, you know, he's, he's had a bit of a disadvantage. He came in, uh, this is his first race back for this year, and uh, he hasn't got a lot of laps. He's only turned 168 laps, and, you know, you compare that to Dario Franchitti's 435 laps, that's a big difference. And... Uh, you know, earlier in the week, he only ran to 16.6 after after his 168 laps. So, you know, again, he was getting everything he could out of the car to qualify at uh, 218.7. I mean, he's not been in an Indy car since 2000, since the end of 2002. So he's out 2003, 2004. And here we are, four events into 2005. How rusty do you get when you've been out that long? Well, you know, I think uh, rust is uh, it's very relative. You know, I think uh, Tony Stewart's dad says, uh, you know, if it rests, it rusts. So, uh, but, you know, he drives go-karts all the time. He's, you know, he's won a championship even last year on motorcycles. So, uh, you know, he, he doesn't rest. So I don't think he's very rusty. He's uh, got a lot of coordination. He's got a lot of natural gift. And uh, I guarantee you, he's, uh, you put him in any of those top cars, he'd get the same pace out of him in qualifying. 1997, he finished third, finished second in 99, driving for Pagan. And that, of course, was Jeff Ward. Now, here's Ari Leindach Jr., who brushed the wall just moments ago. He's yet to qualify. So he was coming up to speed. Uh, we'll see what happened. Uh, turn four there. He just bounces off the wall on the right side. And uh, that little bump looks minor, but at those speeds, Greg, I guess it's a pretty significant hit. Well, I tell you, you know, he's, uh, they're trying to get uh, qualified in today. You know, he was talking about earlier that uh, possibility of rain. And so I think he's got a lot of pressure on himself to try to get the car in the field today. And, you know, there is no good brush with the wall. So in any contact with the wall, any time is, uh, is a bad thing. And I, I think that's going to probably work on his confidence a little bit. He's going to have to really question that. And, uh, you know, we'll see how he does the rest of the day. Let's check in their pits. I think where Vince is standing by with Ari Sr. 
standing with uh, Ari, and uh, did you get any radio communication from Junior in regards to what happened? No, I did not, but I can see what happened, so uh, it's probably going to be too much damage to get that ready and run more today. Because he hit the wall pretty good there with the right rear. What did you see when, obviously, you said you saw what happened. You've been in that seat before, so you're well aware of how that car is handling at that point. What, what did you see from it? Well, he's got some push in the car, and it just, you know, drifts him out towards the wall. But uh, as he entered four, he never really got down low enough, and basically it kind of sucks you to the outside. Even if you get out of the throttle, it will still drive you up there. So, uh, so just still too much push in the car, and it's uh, got to work on the setup more. Earlier in the week, you were working with Ryan Briscoe from the Target Chip Ganassi team as a driver coach. And in essence, you're kind of in a similar role here, but it's with your own son. And I got to imagine that's a little bit different. Uh, how have uh, you adjusted to that or not at all? No, it's pretty much I tell him the same things I told Ryan to look for in uh, different scenarios. But, of course, uh, Junior is in a lot different situation where he just got in the car this morning, really. So so he's uh, obviously way behind on track time. And... Uh, and uh, it's a whole different situation, really. Ryan has done a bunch of races already, of course, and has a, a lot of experience, so it's more fine-tuning there. Ari, how concerned are you that Junior's kind of being thrown into the deep end here where he's got to complete his rookie orientation, try to get qualified all in the same day, and not have a lot of miles before he starts the biggest race in the world? Well, he's definitely at a disadvantage, and obviously uh, with the rain and yesterday with the mechanical problems, we lost two days of running. So, yeah, he's getting thrown into the deep end uh, big time, and I think... Uh, this might be an example of him feeling the pressure a little bit. Thanks, Ari. Okay. Doc? All right, thanks very much, Vincent. You know, there's a long list of famous names here that have helped build Indy history over the years, like the Lion Dykes and the Uncers and the Andretti's. You know, but there's one name I think that a lot of people would say, obviously, he's the open-wheel icon when it comes to what happens here at this racetrack. Since first coming to Indianapolis in 1969, Roger Penske's teams have won a record 13 Indianapolis 500s, beginning in 1972 with Mark Donahue, and most recently in 2003 with Jill DeFerrin. And there's the checkered flag for Mark Donahue. And my dad told me one thing, effort equals results. You're not lucky, the one that puts in the work, and I think that's what it takes, takes to be a winner. Here's a look at the uh, two cars that uh, the legendary open wheel icon Roger Penske has in this year's Indianapolis 500 field at Elio Castroneves and Sam Hornish. And you know, when you talk about Roger Penske, you, you, when you sit with Roger, he tells you, he says, my father taught me years ago that if you want something, you work for it. And when Roger Penske was 11 years old, his very first job was out as a paper boy. And he was awarded by his publisher for never missing a front porch and never allowing a newspaper to get wet. He was Penske perfect even back at the age of 11. Yeah, I think uh, the analogy of the captain, you know, I mean, I think he is synonymous with winning and everything he does is top notch. I mean, I was noticing when they were looking at, uh, when Jamie was down there looking at his wheels, I said those were the shiniest wheels I'd, I'd ever seen. And, and there is no detail left unturned with Roger Penske. I mean, he pushes everything that you can push and uh, things that a lot of people don't think count. And if you look at uh, 30 front row starts in, uh, with his drivers and teams, 13 wins. And I, I think I, I, this is an analogy I've used over my life and, and listening to him from when I was a kid is the harder he works, the luckier he gets, and he works pretty hard. 
He works very, very hard, and we've certainly uh, been thrilled to have Roger Penske be a part of open wheel history here at the Speedway for three decades. When we come back, we'll talk to another young driver who wants to make it in and someday be an Indy 500 winner. Jimmy Quat Kite waiting to qualify for his fifth Indianapolis 500. We'll talk with him when we come back. They call it Fast Friday, but it was Friday the 13th, and it was more like Frightening Friday because rookie Paul Dana slammed the wall here in turn two. The car disintegrates, and along comes two-time champion Sam Hornish. He hits a piece of gearbox, and suddenly the blow over backwards. Hornish goes backwards in the air and comes down on his roof as he slides along at 190-plus miles per hour. Hornish would be okay. Paul Dana, not so lucky. Taken to Methodist Hospital as you watch the replay again. Paul Dana diagnosed with a concussion and two thoracic vertebrae fractured. He's out of the Indy 500. Stepping in his place, 29-year-old driver Jimmy Kite, who, by the way, is standing by with Vince Welch on pit road. Jimmy Kite has been here seven times, but has missed it a couple of times, and you've been in the race four years, looking to make your fifth start. How dramatic is it when you come and you're battling through the last day, you bumped, you get bumped, and because you've been in those situations and now you're looking at another situation where you're trying to get your car in the field. Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, it's weird actually, you know, getting ready to put, get in the car and make an attempt and it's not bump day. I mean, you know, we, we, we can still do some bumping and stuff, but it's, you know, I'm used to not clocking in till tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, I guess that's why I'm so relaxed and calm today. You know, we just, uh, you know, just trying to keep everybody happy. I mean, you know, ethanol and, you know, Ron Hemmelgar, and they all took a, a, a chance on me doing a good job in it. I'm just trying to do everybody a good job, you know, get the car in the field, go run 500 miles next week, and, uh, you know, just see what we can do. I mean, it sucks what happened to Paul, and, uh, you know, we just, we got to get him back healthy and get him back in the car. Until then, you know, I just do, see what I can do. Each year you come back, how does the track change? Does the track change? You weren't in the race last year. Is it different this year? I know they've reground the track and they've done a renewed surface, but is it just different each year or do you find it to be a ch the same challenge? Yeah, you know, the last time they ground it, I got to run that year. And, uh, you know, the track had a bunch of grip in it. Uh, this year, it, they ground it. It's got a ton of grip in it, but just to me, it just, it seems like it's a little rougher, you know, than, than it's been before. Just a couple bumps that, you know, I, like I said, I wasn't here last year, so I don't know what it was like last year, but this year, just to me, I, I noticed a couple bumps that, you know, I've never really noticed in the past. Going to try to put it in the uh, qualifying line here shortly? Yeah, we're going to go out and do a mock qualifying run right now. Just, uh, you know, make sure there's nothing real scary on it. If I have to roll out, you know, it's not going to cost us an attempt. And, you know, as long as it goes good four laps, we'll go ahead and put it in line and put it in the show. Good luck, Jimmy. Thank you very much. All right, Jimmy Kite finished 11th here back in 1998. Four times he's qualified and raced in the Indianapolis 500. His last trip here, he finished 13th driving for PDM, Paul Dantlovich and company. Now trying to qualify for legendary and very loyal IRL IndyCar Series owner Ron Himmelgar, who won this race back in 1996 with Buddy Lazier. Let's take a look at our starting grid front row. Tony Kanad, Sam Hornish, and Scott Sharp, all three former IRL IndyCar Series champions. First time since 91 in all championship row one. Best qualifying effort ever by a rookie, uh, a female here at Indianapolis, Danica Patrick, inside row two, Elio Castroneves, and Dario Franchitti, who desperately wants to win this thing. Back in row three, Vitor Mira, he could be a sleeper, back to slap in the race a year ago. Koski, Matsura, and Buddy Lazier, the 1996 winner. Thomas Engie, the rookie, Thomas Schechter, and Bruno Giancara, the former pole sitter here in row four. Take a look back in row five, Scott Dixon, the 2003 champion, Adrian Fernandez, and Sebastian Bourdais, the reigning Champ Car Series champion. Dan Weldon, the current points leader, Roger Yasakawa and Brian Herda back in row six. Row seven, Darren Manning, Richie Hearn, and rookie Jeff Buckham, making only his second start ever. Alex Barron, Kenny Brett, the 1999 winner, and Ryan Briscoe, the rookie. Row nine, Carpentier, Carpenter, and Jacques Lazier. And row 10, 30 cars have qualified, Marty Roth, Larry Foyt, and Jeff Ward. Well, coming up next, we'll have Sports Center as we go on board with Neil Everett and Dave Repson. We'll update everything that's happening in sports around the world on the Worldwide Leader. But we'll finish up here with another minute of what's happening here on the track at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And we'll remind you, if you want to stay with us, we're going to go over to ESPN2 and continue with the final 60 minutes, the final one hour 
of Indy 500 time trials as day three of time trials continues. Once again, we have three spots to be settled today here in qualifying. 30 cars are in the field. Three drivers yet to run today. Jimmy Kite, we just talked to him a moment ago, trying to qualify for the fifth time at Indianapolis. A.J. Foyt to fourth, trying to qualify for his third Indianapolis 500. And a great story, history being made once again today. Ari Leyendijk, Jr., the son of the two-time Indy 500 winner, trying to get his car up to speed. Qualifying at Indy, it's all about skill and concentration, but it takes a lot of courage four consecutive laps. You've got to be consistent, you've got to be fast, and you've got to keep it off the concrete. That's what it's about. 30 are in, three yet to qualify. Sports Center coming up next on ESPN. Over on ESPN2, we resume with Indy Time Trials Day 3. So long, everyone, from Indianapolis Motor Speedway.